So we are so grateful today to be joined by Dr. Eisman from Cornell University. Um, she's going to be talking to us about climate smart agriculture in the Northeast. Um, so she teaches in the Cornell Brooks MPA program at Cornell University, where she's an instructor for the consulting program evaluation and marketing public policy course. Danielle holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Miami University, a master's degree in marketing and economics from DePaul University, a master's degree in carbon management from the Univers University of Edinburgh, and a doctorate from the Harriet Watt University in consumer behavior. Before joining Cornell, Danielle was a policy analyst at Climate Change in Edinburgh, Scotland, and, and a research assistant at the International Institute for Environment and development, where she researched the national imp implementation of climate change programs for the Scottish government. Danielle further held positions at the Ravenwood Industrial Council, the 2020 Climate Group, and served as the Climate Smart Farming Program Manager for Cornell University for Climate Smart Solutions. There she focused on local and community collaborations, public engagement with climate action planning, and stakeholder engagement in the local, state, and national and international agriculture policy on adaption and mitigation. Um, Danielle's research is focused on climate change impacts and action at the intersection of food access and policy, the use of stand-up comedy and storytelling to promote public engagement in science, and climate change risk for res residents in mobile and manufactured housing. She's also the co-author of our changing menu, Climate Change and the Foods We Love and Need. So her background is extremely aligned with the work we, we do at Food Shed Alliance, and we're very excited to have her this evening um, teach us all about everything she knows about the Northeast um, climate science. Um, we're excited to have you share with us. Um, so take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Tess. I appreciate it. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking with all of you this evening, and I hope you'll jump in with questions as we move forward. Um, I also plan to spend a little bit of time showing you some tools that are freely available for you to use um, that will give you a lot of um, location-specific information about um, your planting season. So you can, we'll take a look at several of those that will be very helpful to you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you all can see that. I lost my little view window of your faces, so I'm assuming. <laughs> Very good, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> Um, so as Tess mentioned, um, so in this session, we're going to talk about climate smart agriculture um, and some of the, the impacts that we're seeing. Um, and yes, it's finally raining. Um, it's raining here too, up in um, Ithaca, New York, where I'm located. Um, and then, you know, we'll We'll look at some of the evidence of what's happening, what's predicted to happen in the Northeast, as well as New Jersey, where you all are located. Um, and then six strategies that are really useful to start exploring for farmers in, in the Northeast. So we'll go through some of those strategies that you can start to think about and explore more deeply um, in terms of what you can do for uh, best management practices on your own land. Um, and so, we go. Um, I won't go into too much detail since Tess already did a fantastic job introducing me. But um, yes, I do have um, kind of a, a wide range in terms of my background, studying chemistry, economics, marketing, carbon management, consumer behavior, as well as culinary arts. Um, and then there's the, the shameless plug for the book that I co-authored, Our Changing Menu, where we really set the book up like a menu and we talk about what's happening to a lot of our favorite foods in the US um, and how climate change is affecting that food, um, not only from um, you know, a growing perspective, but also from the economics of it and what, what farmers are doing, what researchers are doing and what government can do to support uh, farmers and ensure that we are still able to continue producing the foods that we love and need. So 
Um, now I could tell you all what's been happening, but you are all the ones that are out there every day experiencing these impacts firsthand. Um, as the person from Goatwell Farms mentioned, it's raining. Um, and so while I do aim to, to shed some light on why these, these changes are happening, I'd really love to hear from, from you. And you can either unmute yourself or just type it in the chat, but you know, to I'd really like to hear your own experiences your about own experience. what you've ex seen firsthand in terms of what's changing what's becoming difficult for you in terms of being productive. Any brave souls out there? <laughs> no? All right, well, we'll keep going. Um, so, how the Northeast is changing. Um, so overall, we're seeing an increase in the average temperature. Um, and the Northeast is actually experiencing the largest increase in average temperature compared to the rest of the United States. Um, and it's actually happening much more quickly compared to global temperature averages. <laughs> Um, and we're also seeing a lot more intense rainfall events, um, as well as periods of drought. So that's a, a problem that a lot of people across the Northeast are experiencing are these intense rainfall events followed by periods of drought. Um, we're also seeing that, you know, as temperatures are increased in the next, you know, 10 to 12 years, the Northeast is going to be about 3.6 degrees warmer on average compared to what was observed during pre-industrial times. So before the, the um, you know, before the industrial era. Um, and the last time global carbon emissions were this high, which the current um, level of carbon emissions is 424 parts per million, was 3 million years ago. Um, and at that time, when carbon emissions were that high, the average global surface temperature was roughly four and a half to 7.2 degrees warmer compared to what we experienced just a few hundred years ago. So with that high level of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, we're going to see much more um, or much higher levels of warming. We're also seeing shifting seasons, um, as well as more days of intense heat. And so this is kind of a generalization for the entire Northeast, but in thinking about what you've experienced or what you've seen in the last few years, you may be able to recall some of these changes. Okay, so there's been little interest in, in Northwest Jersey, um, and there's been a lack of connection. And yeah, it does take some time. So when we talk about climate change, we say that, you know, a climate change occurs over a 30 year time span. Um, whereas weather is what we see on a daily basis. And what we are seeing over those 30 year time spans is that changes are happening much more rapidly than we had um, previously predicted. And while I don't have um, quotes from farmers in New Jersey, these are, this is a quote from a farmer that we had worked at or worked with through our Climate Smart Farming program at Cornell. Um, and he describes what we call a, a new normal. So in his experience, a new or a normal season doesn't happen like it used to. Um, in his experience, it was either really dry or really wet. And uh, when they do experience rain, it's apocalyptic. So at one, one instance, he got five inches of rain in about one and a half hours, um, which created a lot of soil loss. And for him, that creates an impact for what he sees happening over multiple generations. Um, and this is another farmer that, again, uh, we worked with here through um, or at Cornell. And um, he's a, a dairy farmer. And he had two years in a row where it was 
too dry. So all the forages were in lower production and they used 75 tons of feed a day. And they used all their surplus forage. They ended up buying more grain, which increases costs of production and drops their profit down. And so these new normals or these changes that are starting to happen are really having an impact not only on a yearly basis, but you know, from the previous farmer and his quote that this could happen for ongoing years and could impact multiple generations of their farming family. And if we really think about it, everything that that plants need is changing, right? So plants need air, water, the right temperature, healthy soils, um, and sunlight. And all of those aspects that a plant relies on to thrive are changing, except for sunlight. Uh, where and how much rainfall or snowpack accumulates is changing. The, the quality of soils is, is changing. We have increasing levels of carbon dioxide, and that's creating a lot of, of change in all of those aspects that, that plants really need to survive. And if we look at these a little bit more closely, so what does the, the impact or what is the impact of higher levels of carbon dioxide in the air mean for a plant? Um, well, actually higher levels of carbon dioxide are beneficial to 95% of crops, um, but those benefits are offset by higher temperatures as well as increasing water stress. So those periods of either really intense rainfall or intense drought, right? And because plants really like carbon dioxide, that also means that weeds are much more difficult to control because weeds are plants. Um, and they also like carbon dioxide. They also tend to thrive in warmer temperatures where um, a lot of the plants that we rely on for, for crops don't do as well in those higher temperatures. We're also seeing that um, with higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as plants are um, taking in that carbon dioxide, it's decreasing a lot of the nutrient and protein levels in those plants, and it's increasing the carbohydrate levels in those plants. So what that means for pollinators, such as bees, that there's less protein in pollen for them, um, and that poses a threat for their overwinter health. They really rely on um, high levels of protein, especially from goldenrod in the late fall before they kind of um, you know, rest for the winter. And if they don't get the um, high enough levels of protein and energy that they need, then it threatens their survival. Um, also, it means that there's less protein, vitamins, and minerals in many of the crops that we eat. And so if you think about um, what that means for human health, especially for people who are surviving on um, a lot of plants for their main source of diet um, or their main source of nutrition that can have significant impacts on human health for multiple years. And so how does this warming happen? Um, so our climate changes through changes in certain levels of gases that we have called greenhouse gases. And we call them greenhouse gases because they hold in heat much like a greenhouse. Um, and so gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide really trap heat into the Earth's atmosphere. And so as energy from the Earth or from the sun enters the Earth's atmosphere and bounces back um, into outer space, the gases trap in a lot of that energy that's reflected back, and then that energy or that heat comes back down to the Earth's surface. Um, also, as the um, air warms, it tends to hold a lot more water vapor, and that leads to these more intense hy hydrological cycles, which causes those heavy, intense rainfalls, those periods of droughts, as well as decreased water quality. And we're starting to see a lot of those impacts, um, right? So what we've seen is the shifting of 
plant hardiness zones. Um, and so you can kind of see this animation. It, it's maybe a little bit challenging to see because of um, you know, slow internet signals. But um, we're starting to see, especially over the last few decades, is that the, the, the zones where plants are really thriving is moving northward. And I was in a, a meeting earlier today where um, a farmer from Georgia said that you know, originally you could only grow okra in certain parts of the state, but now he has colleagues up in the northern part of the state and they're starting to fully develop okra. Um, so we're starting to see different different crops that are thriving um, in a much northern latitude compared to um, several decades ago, which you know, provides certain opportunities, especially for farmers living in the northeast where, you know, yes, the climate is starting to become warmer, but that means that you can start to plant a lot of different crops. And just to give you a sense of how things are changing, um, and I, I pulled this information and I chose Salem County, New Jersey, because um, from what I read, that's the, um, the county with the highest level of agriculture in the county compared to the rest of the state. So I just chose that location at random. But as I show you these tools later on in this webinar, um, you can type in um, a different location and it will give you more specific data. But you can see that, um, you know, while there are distinctive differences from year to year in the average annual temperature, the overall trend in the average temperature is that it's increasing, right? Um, and so we show you that, um, you know, the 30 year trend or the much longer trend, um, you know, has a, a uh, more shallow slope, but then over the shorter period of time, um, from 1980 to 2013, it's a much sharper angle in terms of the line. And we see roughly an average in uh, two degree increase in the overall average since 1950 in the temperature for Salem County, New Jersey. We also see changes in the number of growing degree days. Um, so again, I use Salem County for the location to capture this data, but um, what we're seeing is that since 1980, the growing season length um, has increased by almost six days per decade since 1980. Um, and the number of growing degree days has increased um, by 88 growing degree days per decade since 1980. Um, and I do have an anecdote um, from a, a dairy forage system specialist um, that discusses how we can use growing degree days um, for silking to silage harvest. And from his experience, he said an old rule of thumb for duration of, of this growth stage has been six to seven weeks, but um, you know, this really can't be relied on anymore, especially in the, the past few growing seasons. And so having a tool like this that can really show you the length of the, the growing degree days, as well as the length of the, the growing season, can give you some insights on when you might have that, that big period for silking to silage harvest. And I did mention that we've seen an increase in precip precipitation. Um, in the Northeast. And compared to the rest of the United States, the uh, Northeast has seen um, a 71% increase in very heavy precipitation events. So those are those one day um, events where you get one or more inches in a very short period of time. Um, and the Northeast has experienced the greatest increase in heavy precipitation in the United States. And Unfortunately, those events can result in soil compaction, delays in planting, reduction in the number of days when fields are workable. And if this trend in the frequency of heavy rainfall events continues, especially prior to the last frost, 
these overly wet fields could really potentially prevent Northeast farmers from taking advantage of some of the other opportunities that are available to them in terms of a longer growing season or warmer temperatures. Um, and again, thinking about what has um, what has New Jersey experienced, right? So I chose Salem County to look at the total annual precipitation and how that has changed um, over the last few decades, as well as the number of days with heavy precipitation or precip precipitation that is greater than one inch. And again, while we have that variability from year to year, what we can see is the overall average is increasing. So you are experiencing an increase of two and a half inches per decade since 1980. Um, also, the, the number of days with heavy rainfall events has increased over time as well. Just checking the chat. Doesn't look like any questions yet. Um, we did get one question in the uh, Q&A section. And oh, okay. uh, Matt, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and, and just come up right on and ask live. Feel free to do so. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Okay. Um, the question is, um, I don't know if you caught my what I said in the chat, but we really haven't uh, really talked a lot about climate change in the northwest part of the state. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's starting to change now. Um, but sometimes what I hear back is, well, maybe we could do it without saying we're doing it. Um, <laughs> you know, don't say climate change, but just provide financing and so forth. So what do, you, what do you think about that argument? Yeah, I, you know, it, it depends on your, your audience, right? Um, we've definitely had that experience in New York as well, where we have not said climate change. We've said um, managing risk, managing mm -hmm. the impacts of extreme weather events. Right? Um, and if you talk to most farmers, even if you don't say the word climate change, a lot of them will start to talk about how things are different. Um, it's harder to predict what's going to happen in a season. And finding that commonality of that experience will often open the door to those conversations. Um, and one thing I had planned on mentioning later is that with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's um, I think, can't remember the exact number, but I think over $3 billion that's being devoted to farmers that are willing to invest in climate smart agriculture practices. So there are a lot of incentives available to farmers that are willing to try out these, these um, adaptation and mitigation practices, which I will go over. Um, but yeah, you might have to avoid the word climate change when you you talk about it. Um, and it's it's just really kind of feeling out your audience and what are they resistant to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, thinking about those impacts and I guess bringing that to the, you know, making that connection between what is happening with, with weather and climate, and then those real impacts that, that farmers are experiencing on the ground, well, we see those numbers through the, um, the, the payouts for crop insurance. Um, so 2021, drought and heat-related crop insurance payouts um, reached $2.6 billion in the United States. I think last year, those payouts were due to both drought as well as um, heavy precipitation events. So we're seeing um, more and more um, people purchasing crop insurance, as well as the number of payouts are increasing. And those are expected to continue to increase um, as more and more of these events are predicted to happen. And so there's somewhat of a, a, a tension there to, um, where some of the, the crop insurance companies are really trying to push farmers to increase their resilience so that they're less reliant on, on these payouts from year to year, especially with crop insurance um, 
rising in terms of how much it costs annually. And again, we see how a lot of different crops are responding. Um, so looking at some of these generalizations across different parts of the country, we're seeing a greater number of frost-free season lengths. So in the Northeast, um, roughly 10 days longer um, over the last several decades. Um, and we know, you know, well, at least for in New York, group, uh, grapes are blooming six days earlier, apples are blooming eight days earlier um, compared to when they were blooming in the 1960s. Um, but then, you know, if you are working with, um, you know, some of these types of crops with the um, warmer winters, then you experience challenges with reaching dormancy stages, as well as, you know, an early warm up followed by a late frost, which can be very detrimental to um, anyone that's growing specialty crops. Um, and I know that happened um, this year here in New York. Um, so those are some of the challenges that a lot of people are facing. Um, as well as pests and invasives. So I mentioned that, you know, weeds really like the increase in carbon dioxide and they really like the warmer temperatures. Um, and these little critters and diseases are really enjoying the, the changes in carbon dioxide and, and temperature. So we're experiencing increased pressure from weeds and pests, and that means a greater demand for pesticides, um, as well as um, potential higher risks to human health from increased chemical exposures. We're seeing that there's more insect generations per season, uh, there's greater instances of overwinter survival of, of pests, uh, as well as a decoupling from natural enemies. So you know, they're just really thriving in, in the changing climate. And weeds are much more difficult to control. And just some of the um, specific pests that we've started to see in the Northeast is the expansion of the European corn borer and the Western corn rootworm, um, hemlock, woolly, adelgid, codling moth, um, as well as um, a rapid expansion or, or more northern expansion of vector-borne diseases such as late blight. Um, we've also seen the, the kudzu and oriental bittersweet invasive species spread and they massively take over um, multiple spaces. Um, lambs quarters, ragweed, Canadian thistle um, have stronger growth responses to higher levels of carbon dioxide than um, most cash crops. So they're really thriving. Um, and then this increase in carbon dioxide reduces the effectiveness of widely used herbicides. So again, making it really difficult to control um, a lot of the, the pests and invasives that um, used to be much easier to um, get rid of or remove. And so now I wanted to take some time to show you some of the tools that are available to you before I get into what are those practices that can help you in managing some of these challenges and how can you start to put together an adaptation management plan for your own land. And so these tools will help in developing some of those strategies. Um, so some of the tools that we have freely available, and it's through the website, climatesmartfarming.org slash tools. Um, so there's a cover crop scheduler tool, um, and you can put in different varieties of cover crops and it will tell you when is the best time to plant in order to get um, you know, the highest level of biomass. Um, and that really helps in promoting soil health. Um, there's also a water deficit calculator, um, and that will tell you if the plants on your land are about to or will experience um, water stress. Um, and then there's the, the growing degree day calculator. We also have um, climate change in your county 
And so I'll, I'll exit out of this slideshow for a minute and just show you, we can type in some different locations. Um, and just so you could see how they, they work um, and get a sense for um, how you might be able to use them. Is that still visible for you all? Looks good. Good. OK, great. Um, so I chose what I think is the, the Food Shed Alliance address, uh, <laughs> or, or at least close to it. Um, um, and so, you know, you can enter in what the growing degree day base is for um, the type of crop that you're using, and then you can choose a, a different planting date. Um, so we'll just say that. Um, and then you can enter in different targets if you want. Um, and it'll give you a sense of, you know, when you'll start to experience um, the harvest and what's the, the optimal level of growth. Um, it can give you the season to date. Let's see if the summary table works. Um, that's if you put in multiple locations, you can have a summary of um, the locations that you've used. Here's the water deficit calculator. So um, as we've all, you know, as we've mentioned that it's finally raining, um, you know, some of the, your plants, if you're in Vineland, New Jersey, may be experiencing some, some stress. Um, and you can choose the location, the soil type, the crop type, um, when the bud break was, and then if you irrigate, what was the last irrigation? And it will give you, um, oop, maybe that didn't work. Well, I'm not sure why that one isn't working, um, but it'll give you a sense of um, what's been happening and what, what will happen over the next couple of days. Um, and to change your location, you can type in an address in the little address bar. Um, it won't save your address. So if you're worried about your data being stored, um, we don't do that. So, um, you know, you can save it to check a couple of locations. Um, and then as soon as you leave, it should close out and remove your data. Um, so here we could see if we move to Hamilton, New Jersey, there's um, severe plant stress experience there. Andover, sure. So this is plant stress for, well, grass um, in Andover, assuming a, a high, um, high soil water capacity or a clay, clay soil. Um, and then this shows you climate change in your county. Um, and you can look at the average temperature, the high temperature, the lows, um, days above 90 degrees, uh, the growing season length, and growing degree days. And then there's also um, options for selecting total precipitation and heavy precipitation. And when you um, select the county, so if I go back to Salem County, then it pulls up the, the specific data going back um, to the 1950s. And then you could do um, projections so that we could choose a high emissions scenario. So if we don't think that um, globally we're going to reduce carbon emissions, by a significant amount, then we would probably have a high emission scenario. And 
although the data is pretty noisy, you can get a sense for how much um, precipitation will increase over um, the next several decades up until the end of, of the century. And then compare that to low emissions, it goes down. So any questions on those on those tools before I jump back to the um, the presentation? No. Okay. I lost my little presentation window. Here we go. Okay. Um, and then the last tool that I want to show you, um, which is available through the Cornell Emergent Climate Risk Lab, is the drought monitor. So every month they um, predict the, the level of drought um, in the Northeast. And they use the Palmer Drought Severity Index, um, and they use a, a four kilometer resolution. Um, and they monitor drought conditions and provide those updates every single month. Um, so we've seen, well, especially Pennsylvania um, has it been um, experiencing um, a relatively um, high level of drought over the past couple of months. Um, and so has much of the Northeast. So um, you can check back in, um, June, I think this one is from May, um, and they will post what's happening um, in the Northeast um, over the next month, and you can keep checking back. So with all of these changes, um, it's useful to think about not just what are the, the challenges for uh, farmers in the Northeast, but also what are the opportunities? And so, what we see in terms of the challenges is that there's extreme weather, floods, droughts, um, high temperature stress, new pests and diseases, as well as variability and uncertainty. Um, but there's also opportunities. So um, we have adequate water. Um, there's also longer warming growing seasons. There's also shifts in productivity the potential to expand and diversify your markets. Um, and then job creation, economic growth. Um, and as I mentioned, the IRA provides 19.5 billion to support farmers and ranchers in climate change mitigation efforts. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, New North, Jersey Resource Conservation and Development. So that's great. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of um, funding sources and, and grants to support farmers that are interested in trying some of these different activities and different measures. Um, and so one of the, the documents that I believe um, Tess had shared with you all, um, which we're going to talk about next, is the, the six strategies for um, practicing climate smart agriculture. And these are kind of top level, an easy way to start thinking about how to integrate adaptation and mitigation efforts into your, your farm management practices. Um, and so the six key strategies that you could focus on are um, looking at your soil health, um, efficient managing your water resources as well as your risks, utilizing integrated pest management, diversifying crops, species, and enterprises, reducing livestock stress from extreme heat, and engage in farm planning and adaptive management. So we'll look at these in more detail and I'll, I'll give you some examples of, of different things people have done and how it can be helpful. So um, in terms of soil health principles, um, the, the four main approaches that are often recommended 
for maintaining soil health and promoting soil health are minimizing disturbances to the soil. Um, so limiting or using no tillage for um, farming, um, really optimizing and being precise in any type of chemical input, um, rotating livestock, okay? Um, you wanna maximize your biodiversity. Um, and this can help break up disease cycles, stimulate plant growth, provide habitat for pollinators, uh, as well as the organisms living in your soil. So it's been shown that if you increase the plant diversity of your cover crops, um, it really um, helps increase the short-term soil respiration um, and it decreases salt extractable nitrate. Um, and it tends to show, or farmers have experienced, at least in um, Minnesota, they've experienced much more um, productive crops when they've used, um, especially the biodiversity approach in trying to build their soil health. Um, in maximizing soil cover, so planting cover crops can be very effective for um, promoting soil health, um, as well as using organic mulch and then leaving plant residues at the end of um, end of the season really helps to promote um, a lot of that soil health. Um, and then maximizing the presence of living roots. So um, by keeping living roots there, um, you can reduce soil erosion and provide food for organisms like earthworms um, and any of those little microbes that cycle the nutrients um, that your plants need. Um, and you can do this by reducing follow, um, plant, again, planting cover crops, and then using the diverse crop rotations. Um, and so this tends to be something that's promoted quite heavily in um, across um, the USDA, as well as other um, pr key principles of climate smart agriculture. Um, and for farmers that have planted cover crops, um, and this was a small study done in Minnesota, but 85% of the farmers reported improvement in soil attributes or the productivity. Um, there was a decrease in bare ground. There was a significant increase in earthworm counts, um, as well as an increase in microbial activity. And then just the, the visual um, evaluation of soil structure, the VES, um, 67% of farmers reported improvement in soil structure. Um, and this was when um, they planted five or more species, which resulted in more than 80% improvement of soil across multiple types of um, healthy soil indicators. But something to keep in mind is that this often varies from farm to farm. So it's often very helpful to take advantage of a lot of those free resources that people are putting in the chat, um, because it, you know, even the USDA will provide um, free consultations that will give you advice on what your soil needs and what's the the best type of um, cover crops or approaches in promoting soil health for your specific farm. When it comes to um, managing pests. Um, Adopting integrated pest management tends to be very helpful. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're monitoring your, your crops, um, conduct regular scouting for weeds, insects, and any type of pathogens. Um, it's helpful to stay up to date on the changing life cycles and the spread of pests. So as I mentioned before, with the longer growing season, that means that we're starting to see more generations of pests within a single season. Um, also thinking about the different types of crop varieties and animal breeds that are resistant to known pests and pathogens, we're starting to see um, a greater uptake of using the three sisters integration. So the, um, was it maize, soybeans and squash? Um, and so, that's been showing a lot of um, promise in terms of managing some of these, these issues. Um, there's also three different types of biological controls that um, are very 
successful in managing pests whenever possible. So there's the conservation biocontrol, which supports natural enemies that are already present. Um, and so you can do that by giving those natural enemies food, shelter, and protection from things that harm them, um, for example, pesticides. So if, if those natural enemies are going to take care of the invasive pests, it's helpful to make sure that they survive. Uh, there's also classic biocontrols, which is the release of a natural enemy that will reproduce and keep pest populations in check. And then augmentative biocontrol, which is the re release or apply of, of natural enemies repeatedly whenever they're needed um, to, again, reduce pest populations. Um, and so it's always best practice to control pests with proven strategies. Um, and then if you do use pesticides, um, you know, use them correctly, um, especially if it's when pests or pathogens are exceeding economic thresholds. Um, and then always practice sanitary farming practices, so cleaning equipment in between fields to help reduce the, the spread of pests and pathogens. Um, and then efficiently managing water resources and risks. Um, there's a lot of um, practices that are available to you to help manage water, which again, we are faced with both an abundance um, as well as uh, a lack of water depending on, on the season and depending on the time of year. So um, irrigation practices, um, especially as we've moved into more of that precision agriculture where irrigation practices are becoming very high tech, um, where you know it almost looks like you're operating a spaceship sometimes if you're in one of those um, newer tractors. And um, so with newer irrigation, you can have very precise um, water management that uses drip irrigation. Um, there's computer technology that will detect when a plant needs water and precisely how much it needs. Um, and then you can utilize reclaimed water if possible, uh, especially if you're going to be experiencing droughts. So building up those stores of water can be very helpful. Um, tile drainage in fields has been helpful for removing excess water and also for controlling runoff. Um, thinking about uh, future demand for water, um, as well as your capacity for storing water, whether that's constructing deeper wells, um, putting in more ponds, uh, those practices can be very helpful in making sure that you have water available to you when or if there is a drought. Um, and then timing your fertilizer and, and manure applications based on weather forecasts, although we know that Sometimes it's tricky to forecast the weather, um, but really, you know, making sure that you're trying to time those as um, precisely as possible. Um, and then constructing oversized and covered manure pits to minimize overflow risks during heavy rainfall events. Um, and then using riparian buffers along streams and ponds to capture any remaining runoff. Um, and what we've seen from a lot of um, you know, research and what a, a lot of my colleagues have, have shown or have predicted is that you know, farming success in the Northeast will require these technologies that really integrate site-specific site monitoring with decision tools to adapt to all of these changes that we're experiencing, so whether it's those heavy rainfall events or those periods of drought. And so using some of these newer technologies can be very helpful um, because we are going to be vulnerable to both increased frequency of heavy rainfall events as well as too little water. Um, and farmers are often faced with these complex decisions regarding whether or not they should adapt by investing in irrigation equipment, a drainage system, or both, and when. Um, and so, you know, based on again, your specific needs and what resources you have available to you. Um, you have to think about whether or not purchasing new planting or harvesting equipment that can cover more acreage more quickly um, as a strategy to complete your farm operations within smaller windows of opportunity. 
um, you know, if fields are going to be flooded, you need to get out there more quickly and cover more ground more quickly versus whether or not, you know, you can control the water that falls on your land and then save that water for another day. Um, or shifting your crop production to fields that are less prone to drought or flooding based on the soil type, the topography, um, prior management, thinking about your soil organic matter that can maximize water holding capacity, um, enhancing water infiltration rates, and then improving that drainage. So all of these activities can really help in managing those water risks very efficiently and effectively. And diversifying crops um, or species or enterprises. Um, as I mentioned, the example of, of okra earlier, right? Um, you know, what are we going to be able to grow in the Northeast as the seasons change, as the average temperature change? changes and as the plant hardiness zones start to move more northward. And so you can start to experiment with, with different um, cash crops and see what works and what doesn't. We're also seeing a lot more um, controlled environment agriculture where some people are um, moving certain crops indoors where they can use fewer resources or fewer inputs um, and really control all of the inputs that go into producing certain crops um, and uh, a lot of uh, the controlled environment agriculture has been successful in um, in places across New York State and and beyond. Um, it also allows for more diverse um, opportunities to grow different types of, of foods. Um, we're also seeing a shift in some of um, you. Know, some people may call them novel ingredients, but they're often referred to as traditional ingredients. Um, and so we're starting to see more and more um, planting of um, quinoa, um, as well as teff and sorghum. And um, you know they're referred to as ancient grains, but they're rapidly on the rise. Um, just in, in 2018, um, the marketing firm or market research firm, Mintel, showed that um, 123 new products were introduced um, in 2018 that contained millet um, over the course of one year. And a lot of these grains are showing huge poten potential for thriving in the United States. So um, quinoa is being grown in um, in the Northwest Plains, um, as well as parts of Canada. Um, and teff is being grown in Nevada, um, you know, where it's drought resistant and Nevada doesn't get a lot of rain. Um, and then again, seeing some more of these um, other types of grains such as sorghum and millet and amaranth. Um, and it also has been shown to be beneficial to um, our diets. So adding more diversity to our diets um, and to agriculture has benefits for our health, um, but again, also protects soils and moves us away from monoculture, which can um, degrade soils and increase erosion. And I saw a question pop up. Um, how much can farmers help to address climate change through carbon sequestration? Um, that's a great question. And it's difficult to assess that because a lot of the on-farm emissions are still very difficult to accurately um, assess. And then you have the aspect of the land use change, um, which, you know, if you're growing something which is sequestering carbon, but then you're cutting it down, then it offsets that sequestration. So if you are able to adopt aspects of agroforestry, then you would have a higher chance of sequestering carbon um, and then, you know, really diversifying the, the crops on, on your land by integrating, you know, forestry with crops. Um, it also helps to um, overcome some of the challenges with high heat. So if you have um, crops grown between trees, then that often protects them from intense heat. Um, 
but a lot of the emissions through mitigation tend to be seen through um, activities such as your um, your energy usage, um, whether or not you're using um, certain types of fossil fuels through your, um, you know, whether you're using that with your tractors or just the overall energy production on on your land, um, as well as transportation. There's also a lot of great promise with biochar. So if you're able to take some of those waste um, outputs and then use that to sequester carbon, that can be very effective as well. Um, you also wanna make sure that you are, um, if you do have livestock on your farm, um, taking measures to ensure that you're reducing um, stress from extreme heat. Um, so even though we're able to um, you know, be productive with cattle that are adapted to warmer climates, um, if animals are, are too hot, they are less productive. Um, so you wanna make sure that um, if you have dairy cows or dairy facilities, that those facilities are well ventilated, that they have proper cooling mechanisms in place. Um, this includes calf housing, um, lactating and dry cow facilities, and access to shade while out on pasture. Um, there's fans and sprinkler systems that are controlled with automatic sensors to reduce the risk of heat stress on all animals. Um, all animal classes should have access to fresh, clean water, and then monitor and adjust diets for daily intake. Um, any rations should be balanced to meet the animal needs to reduce intake during periods of hot um, heat stress. Although we know that, you know, especially cattle, if they're if they're too hot, or I guess all animals, if they're too hot, they eat less, um, and so that makes them less productive. Um, you know, you can feed animals, um, you know, a, a lower energy diet. Um, so there were studies that have shown um, if you feed cattle, um, high roughage, low energy diets, it tends to lower their body temperatures, especially during high, um, high temperature seasons or high temperature days. Um, and then conversely, in winter, when temperatures are very low, cattle are fed high energy diets and they were able to keep up their internal temperatures. So um, diet can have um, a helpful effect when the temperatures are uh, very extreme. And so it's it's useful to know some of those aspects when, when feeding um, your livestock. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're engaging in farm planning and adaptive management. Um, and I'll give you some resources, again, in addition to um, the, the great links and, and suggestions that have been put in, in the chat. Um, but you want to think about how you can develop an adaptation plan to identify your risks um, and then come up with practices to remediate those risks. Um, it's helpful to conduct a whole farm energy audit to increase your energy efficiency and think about what are those opportunities for renewable energy. Um, again, there's a lot of incentives and tax breaks for switching to renewable, renewable energy sources. Um, use those precision farming apps, um, those weather and climate tools, such as the, the climatesmartfarming.org. There's also the um, United States uh, Resilience Toolkit that is available, and that has uh, a much wider range of, of tools that are available. Um, also think about how you can, um, if you are building new farm buildings or renovating farm buildings, um, think about how they could be designed to be more energy efficient, as well as withstand any type of um, predicted weather conditions, including severe heat, heavy rainfall, wind, snow loads, hail. Um, when purchasing new farm equipment, select options to maximize that fuel efficiency. Um, 
And then that helps to decrease labor and time constraints. And then considering or consider purchasing crop insurance to reduce any economic risks. And oftentimes there are incentives to um, integrating a lot of these adaptation and mitigation efforts when purchasing crop insurance, because there is that push, as I mentioned earlier, to encourage farmers to be more resilient in their practices. And then thinking about um, you know waste and you know how you can use that as another um, you know either source of income or reducing some of your your need to purchase certain input. So um, biochar has been showing a lot of promise. Um, it's been it is created from agricultural waste like corn husks, stems, leaves, etc. Um, and it's promising because it captures carbon dioxide absorbed by plants and then bakes it down into a substance that can then be added to the soil. Um, and that sequesters carbon dioxide rather than releasing it into, um, into the environment during decomposition. Um, and biochar can capture large amounts of ammonia gas um, and then creating biochars with higher nitrogen contents. Um, is even higher than animal manures. Um, and it can really help in facilitating the growth of microbes and plants when added to the soil. Um, it tends to increase crop yields as much as inorganic fertilizers. And this is based on a, a global analysis um, of several studies. Um, and it tends to, um, you know, ensure that it doesn't um, or that farming practices don't disrupt social or um, environmental practices. So it's something that can be easily um, worked into what you're already doing on the farm. There's also been some interesting opportunities of turning waste into solutions. Um, although we do try to make use of, of everything on the farm, um, you know, we've started to see different um, organizations and, and um, you know, services pop up where they're um, making use of, of ways to create new products. So for instance, this organization, which is based in um, Brooklyn, New York, but they, um, they take spent grains and other food waste and then turn them into um, baked goods and different, different types of products, including um, uh, something that they call super flour, um, which is um, used to make granola and, and brownies. Um, they give you an introduction into the bioeconomy concept. Um, well, I'm not a biochar expert, so um, I wouldn't be able to give you that detail, but um, I can dig up some resources and um, and reach out to a colleague that is much better versed in the bioeconomy. And I can share that with Tess um, tomorrow if that's acceptable. That sounds great. And then I'll just, whatever, um, we can kind of compile um, additional resources as well as all the ones that we talk about today and I'll send them out to everybody. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, um, and you know, for further adaptation resources. So I, I dug a little bit more deeply into the six key strategies for, um, for climate smart agricultural practices, um, but the USDA has created the um, this adaptation workbook, um, which will help you develop an adaptation management plan for your for your lands. Um, and I included the QR code, um, which will take you to that resource. Um, it's a big book, but it, there's a lot of um, helpful tools in there as well. In addition to the, the climate smart farming tools that I've shared with you um, and the six key strategies that we've developed at Cornell. Um, and that's actually all that I have for you all. Um, so hopefully you all have some, some great questions in addition to the ones that um, you've already shared.
This has been so great. Dr. Eisman, thank you for um, sharing all this information with us. I know definitely my, my brain is already spinning about um, different projects we can do with some of the sage farmers and um, even more webinars we can we can host to go deeper into some of these topics. I know that this is like a really broad ranging, um, there's so much depth <laughs> to, to all of this. It's hard to cover it all. Um, so we appreciate you jumping in with this. So yeah, if anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to jump in now and, and ask them. We can just unmute yourself and, and jump right in. Um, yeah. My interest was definitely peaked when we started talking about agroforestry. Um, I think about that a lot as far as like how to develop more permanent systems so that um, less soil is being disturbed. Like right now at the um, Sage Andover site, so the Food Shed Alliance, um, we're, we're implementing a little pollinator habitat to enhance some of the native pollinators. So it kind of ties into that, um, you know, mitigating pests naturally. Um, and when we're, we're trying to develop the site on just this really thick grassy area, and it's so hard to even disturb the soil the first time to get it established. And um, just thinking of ways to, to really get that going is, <laughs> it's, it's tough work farming. Um, um, yeah. Hey, Tess, can I interject here? Please, please. I mean, your thick grassy description, what you really mean to say is we've got a, so much mugwort that we can't, you know, we have to do something to kind of combat that mugwort. And it's very hard to get rid of. And so do you have any suggestions on what we can do to like combat the mugwort, doctor? Um, um, let's go back, let's to, go the back to the natural enemies um or natural controls for the the mugwort i know i i spent <laughs> all weekend pulling weeds um <laughs> so. well maybe we get some goats maybe we get some goats over there we have a goat farmer oh, yeah. i was thinking oh, yeah. about i was thinking about cutting it low and putting like uh, solarization tarps down mm -hmm. you know that sort of thing can, can, can i uh, this I, is from, from, from usa agro uh, uh, we we have like mugwort everywhere, and it 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 multiplies by millions, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, since uh, since I have a goat, goat is like a superman enemy for the mugwort because goat likes mugworts from <laughs> from leaves to the roots, you know. So uh, I found uh, those mugworts, uh, which were uh, which is which was taking over all the grass and spreading to like more than one uh, uh, one or two acres of grassland. Now I see with my seven eight goats, mugworts are uh, down to the ground now. I don't know uh, whether the mugwort will survive without having leaves next season, but uh, it is, I think, welcoming uh, sign uh, if we can rotate goats uh, to uh, like other pollinator area or other uh, farming area when there is a no, uh, you know, cash curve, mm -hmm. uh, then we uh, we can really naturally. Uh, get rid of the mugwort before they bloom and spread the seeds. So I think uh, it's a way to go. And I think uh, Food Set Alliance has a electric fence ready, uh, means movable mobile electric fence, so we can move goat uh, that area. So this is my really interesting uh, experience this year, having a goat 
uh, as a natural, what is called enemy or eliminator. <laughs> That's great. And everybody loves goats, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, I see a, a question um, from Asim. So is the acceptance of hydroponics or in, indoor farming in controlled environments increasing? And are these alternate farming me methods commercially viable? Um, I would say that they're definitely increasing in terms of the acceptance. Um, as far as commercially viable, it depends if you have the large enough space. Um, and actually, I'm I'm going to the Netherlands next month to see these massive commercially viable um, controlled indoor farming um, environments. Um, which is how the, the Netherlands is growing a lot of their food now. Um, and they're promoting it as a, a, a good case of where they are able to make it um, commercially viable while also ensuring that the crops that they're producing is um, environmentally sustainable and uses uh, the lowest amount of inputs um, absolutely necessary. So it'll be interesting to see that on such a large scale. Um, I think here in the US, if you're able to build a space that has um, enough to make it commercially viable, um, you know, and, and there's different layouts and different forms of, of growing, whether it's on the, you know, the long tiers or across different stacks, um, if you can keep your energy usage down or rely on renewables for that, um, it, it tends to be, it can be pretty viable. And then, you know, if you have certain restaurants and certain um, consumers that are demanding some of those types of, um, types of, you know, specialty produce or grown in that type of environment, um, you know, it, it can be commercially viable. Um, Matt. Um, I think I've asked all my questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yeah. Can you explain about uh, agro farming, please? Agro Sorry, uh, agroforestry. Agroforestry. Yeah, um, I mean, the basic premise is that you um, create an environment where you're able to, um, you know, have trees growing and then crops in between them, and then sometimes you integrate livestock in as well. So somewhat like what you're you have found with using goats to manage the weeds, um, and so the way that you space out the trees with the crops. Um, you know, you can plant things in a way where you, you're adding the biodiversity, you're protecting your crops from extreme heat. Um, and then, you know, ideally, they're not competing against each other in terms of water or sun or um, some of those other aspects that uh, plants need. It also tends to help with some of that carbon sequestration. So so that means uh, if there is a, a, a really uh, thoughtfully planted fruit trees around the bare farmland, mm -hmm. that is a good idea? Yes. Yes. Y yeah, uh, because uh, my, my experience from my country, Nepal, I'm from originally from Nepal, mm -hmm. is in our village, we don't have uh, farming without fruit trees, citrus trees, or banana, or what, whatever uh, useful, even the, the big, big uh, tree, uh, which gives the good leaves for the animal. Uh, so uh, in the village, uh, we cannot have only like, right now we have bare farmland. There is another single tree where uh, goat can uh, take a rest when there is a really mid mid sun, 
So when mm. I go to farm, I don't see goat in middle of the afternoon because they are, they are too far away from the shelter and they're too hot. So mm. uh, I I I I'm missing my village because village has all little shade with a very uh, uh, useful fruits uh, in you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good idea, and I'm I think uh, uh, Food Set Alliance. Uh, is agreed uh, with me to plant some of the mulberries and other things so that it will be uh, very nutritious for goat and at the same time some little shade right yeah thank you yeah thank you i love that That's great. Yeah. And I, I see, Jess, you added too that there really is a huge opportunity in New Jersey for this kind of farming because we have um, we have a bunch of amazing little farms popping up all over the place. But there are still so there's still so much farmland that's just covered in commodity crop. And there's really um, there's a really great opportunity for all kinds of trees, fruit trees, nut trees. Um, and then I, I just, I love the idea of intercropping them as well, right? Because, I mean, I guess that's all of what agroforestry is, but um, yeah, and a lot of the ground has been, yeah, it really, it needs help, honestly, all of that land. Mm -hmm. um, and this seems like, that seems like such a great solution to really help to mitigate the damages and, um, those tree roots are essential for, you know, combating erosion too. I see so much of, I'm so glad we're getting rain right now. Um, but then the, the, the flip side of that is that we've been in a drought for so long. Like <laughs> there's a, there's a point of this rain that's going to then, like you were talking about in the beginning, wash away so much that's been loosened up. So um, definitely a lot of solutions compounded in, in everything that we've talked about today. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for having me and for asking great questions. And I will, I will reach out to someone who is an expert in biochar. Um, and I apologize that I only know a little bit about biochar. <laughs> so. I feel like that's the, uh, I mean, of course it's like an, it's an ancient practice that's been used for, for so long, but our modern, um, modern, sciences and everything are only kind of just scratching the surface of it it seems mm -hmm. um not that i'm any kind of expert but i'm i'm only just learning about it as well so um definitely definitely more to learn there we look forward to that um yeah but if anyone else has any more questions please feel free to jump in now um if not i'm happy to take any questions after the fact and pass them along to Dr. Eisman. Um, uh, this recording will be available on the Food Shed Alliance website, foodshedalliance.org slash farmer training. Um, and I, I'll make sure everyone who's attended today gets it directly. Um, and it, as long as you're okay with that, Dr. Eisman, I'll include your contact information there. People can send you questions. Um, but I appreciate everybody popping on today. This has been a great session and I um, hope everyone has some little nuggets of information to, to go away with. And I know I, I definitely do. So thanks so much. And thanks so much. And can't, can't, um, um, can't, can't forget as well to um, plug in July on the 17th, Dr. Eisman will be back with us to talk about um, marketing for small farmers um, and some of the recent research she's done for that. So when I send out the recording of this one, I'll definitely include the registration link for that next webinar. Um, so everybody can make sure you're here for that. That's gonna be a great one as well. Um, Tim, I didn't mean to cut you off. So if you have anything to add, please jump back in. Back in. I just wanted to say thank you. It was a really very good lecture, very informative. Well, thank you. Thank you. And we love Cornell. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, have a wonderful night. And I really hope that everyone is getting some 
some much needed rain. <laughs> thanks again, Dr. Eisman. Have a great yeah, night. You too. Thanks. Bye. Take care.